Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Tribe Tuesday. My name is Anthony Bryant, and I am the Outreach and Engagement Associate with the Tribe. The Tribe is a digital media outlet that's been centering Black voices in Chicago since 2017. If you're new to Tribe Tuesday, this is our monthly panel series where we invite community leaders, residents, public officials, and experts to join us to discuss current events in our community. Today, we are honored to have Mayor Lori E. Lightfoot to join us for a town hall. Tiffany Ward Walden will be our moderator this evening. She is an award-winning journalist who was recently named a leader for a new Chicago by the Field Foundation. She's also the tribe's co-founder and editor-in-chief, hailing from the west side of Chicago. Welcome, Tiffany. Hello, everyone. Thanks for the introduction, Anthony. I really appreciate it. No hey, y'all. My name is Tiffany Walden, and I am the co-founder and editor-in-chief of The Tribe. Also, I'm a West Sider, born and raised in North Lawndale. Welcome to Tribe Tuesday, which is sponsored by the Field Foundation of Illinois. When we started The Tribe in 2017, one of our goals was to build bridges between our most disenfranchised communities in Chicago and the media. As a girl growing up, out West, I only remember seeing news cameras in my neighborhood when something bad happened. Since 2017, we've worked hard to build a news organization that centers and engages with underrepresented voices in Chicago. That's why I'm proud and honored to moderate a special Tribe Tuesday today with Mayor Lori E. Lightfoot, which we hope is the beginning of, more, of a more accessible, inclusive, and transparent conversation between community members, elected officials, and local media. Right now, I'd like to introduce the Lens on Lightfoot partners. Back in 2019, seven local news organizations came together under the Institute for Nonprofit News to launch the Lens on Lightfoot project, a news series aiming to examine the Lightfoot administration. The Lens on Lightfoot partners include Better Government Association, Black Club Chicago, Chalk Beat Chicago, The Chicago Reporter, The Daily Line, La Raza, and us at the Tribe. Welcome y'all. It's been a pleasure collaborating with each of you for almost a year now. Now, we're pleased to welcome the 56th mayor of Chicago, Lori E. Lightfoot. Mayor Lightfoot is Chicago's first African-American female mayor and first openly gay mayor of any major city in the US. A native of Maslin, Ohio, Mayor Lightfoot has been a resident of Chicago since 1986. Since taking office in May, 2019, Mayor Lightfoot has been faced with immense challenges from the unprecedented COVID-19 crisis to historic budget deficits to a spike in violence in Chicago's communities this year. We are pleased to welcome Mayor Lori Lightfoot to Tribe Tuesday to talk about these issues as well as other important topics facing the city of Chicago's residents today. Thanks for joining us, Mayor Lightfoot. You all can follow along with our live tweets on Twitter using hashtag Tribe Tuesday, the Chicago reporters Rita Alejandra Ose Guerra, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, will live tweet in Spanish and Block Club Chicago's Hannah Alani will be live tweeting in English. Let's jump in everyone. Welcome Mayor Lightfoot. So we're going to start off our discussion today about the 2020 census. Y'all, it's a census year. At the Tribe, we've been writing stories about the 2020 census since March. Please, 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 y'all, fill out the 2020 census if you haven't already. It plays a big role in the number of electoral college votes we get, the 2020 congressional redistricting, and how funds are spent on schools, Medicaid, affordable housing, and more. Here to ask the first question of the evening is the editor-in-chief of the local La Raza Spanish newspaper, Jesus Del Toro. Jesus, let's get to it. Hi, hi. Thanks, Tiffany, for this event, and thanks, Mayor Lightfoot, for being here. Uh, my first question is, uh, what are the implications from your perspective of the low census response rate in Latino and African-American communities? Because we are seeing that not enough people are answering the census and that may have, you know, in the near future and in the next decade, several implications. And we want your perspective on this and we can what we can do to address this. Mayor, I'm sorry, I think you're on mute. We can't hear you.
We're still unable to hear you. Give us one second, everyone, while we, not yet, Mayor. Give us one second while we figure out uh, the technical uh, issues happening with the audio. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now, perfect. Okay. I think it was on our end, I apologize. So the question is about um, the census in particular, uh, what we need to do and some of the challenges of reaching <clears throat> areas of the city that traditionally have an undercount, that's our immigrant refugee uh, communities, but also um, communities of color writ large. <clears throat> As you well know, uh, for well over a year, uh, the Trump administration has done everything possible uh, to try to dissuade people from filling out the census. Started with put, trying to put a citizenship question on the census, um, and then it's ramped up from there. Even when they've lost, they've never stopped. <clears throat> um, couple that with the fact that we've been um, struggling um, through a global pandemic, it's made all of our outreach efforts all the more difficult. Uh, but we're not giving up. Tomorrow is the um, September 30th, and we're continuing uh, our efforts. Uh, the, as you know, there's a court case that's uh, going on in the uh, the Ninth Circuit, which is on the, uh, the West Coast. Um, we're expecting to get a ruling uh, from the appellate court there to tell us how long um, the, uh, we can keep counting. But we have a plan to keep counting until a court tells us uh, to stop. So we're uh, really been focused for the last six weeks or so on those areas of the city uh, that are hard to count. I was in uh, Little Village uh, just last week um, doing a last push uh, to get people to recognize the importance of the census. Um, we have had census activities um, that have been led both by mayor's office personnel, community-based organizations, and in the Census Bureau itself, fanning out all across the city uh, to try to continue uh, to educate people about the importance of the census. And we're gonna keep doing that work because as Tiffany uh, teed up the question, it really is the threshold gating uh, issue for federal funding, federal representation, and we will not get our fair share from Washington on either of those fronts if we are not making sure that everyone is counted. We're at about 60% citywide right now. <clears throat> we expect that number to go up in the next few days. Um, while that's not a number that uh, we're happy with, we continue to be among the top two or three of big cities across uh, the country. But we've got to keep focused and making sure that we continue to do everything at the grassroots level to educate people about the importance of the census. And we're going to keep pushing through the finish line um, whatever date that is, and we hope it's still October 31st, which is the original date that the census had set. Thank you, Mayor. And um, everyone, I just want to um, encourage us to keep our answers and our questions short because we have a lot of uh, news organizations that we got to get through. Um, but thank you again, Mayor, for your answer. Let's I'll jump. Do, I'll do my best, Tiffany, but I don't speak in sound, <laughs> so I'll I try. I know. <laughs> know, I know. Um, so we're going to jump right into COVID 19. Um, since March, we've all been grappling with the new reality of masks and hand sanitizers, which are now starting to smell more and more like tequila these days. And <laughs> of course, not being able to hug our families and friends the way that we used to. Just yesterday, Mayor, uh, you and the Chicago Department of Public Health announced that you're easing up the city's phase four guidelines, including reopening bars for indoor service, allowing restaurants to serve alcohol until 1 a.m. and more. Let's go back to La Raza's Jesus Del Toro for his next question. Thank you, Mayor, again. Uh, well, uh, Tiffany said that this reopening is going to start, as mentioned, where you, you allow now these uh, extended activities. But what the city is doing and what can do more to address the hard fact that COVID-19 is affecting a lot more the Latino and African-American communities almost 48 percent of cases are latinx and more than 42 percent of deaths are african-americans uh, disproportionate uh, you know uh, hit communities what can you do more because covid 19 is going to last unfortunately for a while 
Look, we have been um, very, very focused on the Latinx community in particular. Um, we expanded our racial equity rapid response um, task force uh, to uh, include uh, members of the Latinx community focusing on the northwest side of the city, the southwest side of the city. We've been partnering with community-based organizations, both healthcare organizations uh, and clinics, um, as well as community-based organizations to do what we, I think we've done and successfully, which is reach out, educate, bring people into services, and substantially expand testing. We've made a lot of progress, in particular on the northwest side of the city, where we're finally starting to see over the course of the last two weeks, overall, the cases in the Latinx community go down, but we are still very much challenged on the southwest um, side of the city, and we just gotta continue to educate and go deep into those neighborhoods. That's the only thing that we know that's effective, um, and that's the way that we connect people up uh, with services and educate them about what they can do uh, in their homes uh, and in, at their jobs to protect themselves from COVID-19. So that work continues, but I'm happy to say we're starting to see a downward trend in those cases that really challenged us all summer long. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Jesus, for uh, your questions today. Now I want to bring on Yana Kunichov from Chalk Beach, Chicago, a nonprofit news organization reporting on education in the city. We're still on the topic of, co on the topic of COVID-19. Uh, Yana has a couple of questions for the mayor as well. Hey, thank you, Tiffany. Hi, Mayor Lightfoot. Um, hey. Restaurants and bars have been open this summer, and by fall, the COVID case positivity rate had ticked up and schools didn't open. Now those COVID-19 rates are, are down from the summer level, but just recently you announced expanded access to bars and restaurants. So what would you say to parents that are counting on schools reopening in November? Well, we haven't made a decision yet whether or not that's going to be possible. And there's no comparison, as you know, between bars, restaurants, and school setting. In the school setting, we've got to look at the entire uh, school community um, and focus on what is going to make sure that every single member of that school community is safe the principals, the teachers, the staff, and of course, uh, the students. We're following very closely um, the experience of the Archdiocese schools, many of which have been um, in-person learning uh, five days a week or um, a hybrid model that includes in-person uh, learning. So I think there's a lot that we can learn from their experience. Uh, they serve many of the same neighborhoods uh, where CPS schools are. But again, our primary focus is on making sure that we keep um, our entire school community um, safe, and we're going to be guided by uh, the public health guidance. So I think we're, um, we will make an announcement uh, relatively soon about what um, November will look like uh, for CPS. Uh, but as I said, we're following very closely the experience of other school systems uh, that have already um, stepped up their in-person learning. Now, it's not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison or a whole host of reasons, but I do think there are things that we can learn from them because they seem to have done a very good job in similar neighborhoods under similar circumstances, keeping their school community um, safe. And so my, I'll go ahead. Um, my second question is about Outreach for Chicago Connected, which is the city's expanded internet program for school families. So that program didn't fully launch until August. And by the time school has started, only a quarter of the 10,000 families had signed up. So there's still some struggles with access. Why do, why do you think the city is so far from its goal? Well, let me give you um, the most uh, recent numbers on Chicago Connected, because I think it's important. We're not where we um, certainly wanted to be. Um, and I think part of the difficulty is, even though it's free, um, it's about making sure that families feel safe um, in signing up. We've also had some challenges uh, because some of these families have outstanding debt to their providers, so we're working through those issues. Currently, uh, we have uh, over 25,000 households that are signed up, and that is the equivalent of almost 38,000 um, students towards our, um, our goals of 60,000 households and 100,000 students. Now, we've made significant progress in a relatively short uh, period of time, um, and this is a program 
that is being cited nationally. We have people all over the country calling us to, uh, to understand how we were able to launch this program because the digital divide is real in cities all across the country, and it particularly hits um, school children uh, in certain neighborhoods across the country. So we are continuing to be diligent. We've engaged a number of different community uh, stakeholders to help us continue to do outreach. Uh, we're really leaning into uh, building uh, principles where we're seeing low connectivity amongst uh, the students. So that's where we're really spending a significant amount of time to make sure that parents understand that this option is available and then providing them with the technical assistance they need to just get registered so we can get them connected. Um, you know, as you know, well, no, we spent a significant amount of time getting devices into the hands of students. We're going to continue to do that. But if you don't have connectivity, Wi-Fi and broadband, having the device that can't connect up is really meaningless. That's why this program is so important. And I'm grateful for the families that have signed up, but we're going to keep pushing hard to go deeper into those communities where I think that this uh, program could really be a tremendous benefit. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Yana, for your question as well. Now, I want to transition to policies. At uh, Mayor Lightfoot's inauguration in May 2019, she invoked the spirit of the late Chicago Mayor Harold Washington in her speech. I was there covering the moment, and I even heard some Black women uh, you know, in the crowd shouting amen and divine agreement with you that <clears throat> night and with your uh, progressive platform. Uh, you promised to improve education and safety in every ward and work to eliminate automatic uh, privilege. However, organizers and other critics don't view you as a progressive mayor a lot of times. Um, they worry that your policies won't deliver for Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities. Uh, now I'm going to welcome Alex Nitkin from the Daily Line to ask his question about affordable housing. Thanks, Tiffany. Hi, Mayor. Um, the city is facing an affordable housing crisis that's only gotten worse under the pandemic, but a lot of wards in the city have almost no legally enforced affordable housing. Um, now, during the campaign, you proposed an affordable housing equity ordinance, which would have set up an expedited approval process for affordable housing proposals and wards that are lacking um, affordable units. So my question now is, is something like that still in the cards? Is it still possible to have some kind of citywide mechanism to override aldermen who invoke aldermanic privilege to resist the construction of more affordable housing in their wards? And if so, what does that look like? Well, I don't know that aldermanic prerogative is the, 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 the barrier. Um, the barrier that we've heard over and over, over again, whether it's for-profit um, uh, housing developers um, or um, community-based um, housing developers, is just making sure that these deals work, making sure that there is a funding stream uh, to support affordable housing. So um, our housing commissioner, um, along with uh, the housing committee chairman uh, and city council, has really been working diligently all across the city uh, to um, come up with uh, ways that we can break down some of these barriers. Uh, today, I was um, at a, a senior housing center uh, that opened up on the far south side in the 8th Ward. It's 134 units, most of which um, are affordable and allows uh, residents uh, to stay in that neighborhood, particularly longtime residents, many of whom sold um, houses, um, moved out from family members so that they could take advantage of these opportunities. But no one's satisfied uh, with the pace at which um, we're building and bringing online affordable units, least of all me. That's why, for example, we recently announced a new policy on transit-oriented development that puts an uh, emphasis on equity. Now, transit-oriented development has been around for quite some time, but we've never done it with an eye towards equity. We've never done it uh, to make sure that we are building inclusive uh, opportunities for people to stay in their neighborhoods, which means building affordable um, units, but also family-sized units, uh, which we was lacking in a lot of the um, uh, uh, transit-oriented development. So we are trying a variety of strategies, not a one-size-fits-all um, strategy, to make sure that we're bringing more units online and we're doing it in different areas of the city so that affordability is not the um, tantamount to segregating affordable housing into certain areas of the city and never seeing it um, develop in other areas of the city. Now, we're 17 months in, 
So we're making progress and we're not going to be able to undo um, everything in um, you know, one fell swoop, but we are very, very committed to expanding affordability um, to our city because it's important to make sure that we maintain the integrity of neighborhoods and our population across the city. If we don't have affordable places for people to live, Chicago's population is going to continue to shrink and we're going to see an even greater stratum between um, so-called haves and have-nots. We want to make sure that there's uh, economic diversity um, in our neighborhoods. And the only way we get there is with affordable housing options in a lot more neighborhoods than exist right now. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Alex. We're going to bring Alex back on a little later uh, with his second question. Um, right now, I want to transition to uh, Alejandra Cancino from the Better Government Association a Chicago-based investigative journalism nonprofit organization. She has a couple of questions about environmental harms and the city's oversight. Hi, Mayor. Thank you for being here. Sure. Um, as a candidate, you propose bringing back the city's Department of Environment to prioritize protecting business, uh, I'm sorry, to prioritize protecting residents from polluting businesses, lead in the water, brownfields, and dirty air. But you have since had to downsize that idea and now only have an office with one staffer because of the city's nearly $1 billion deficit. Chicagoans are once again facing a large deficit. Where does your promise of a Department of Environment stand now? And absent a department, how can your administration really keep your campaign promises to fully protect residents from environmental harms? Well, we're dealing with the realities of where we are in our, uh, in our budget. As you know, we had $800 million loss in revenue for 2020. We have a $1.2 billion deficit uh, projected for next year. And let me just push back on one part of your question. It's not a single person. We have a chief sustainability officer, but there's a whole team of people across the city that work on environmental issues um, in the Department of Public Health, in the Department of Buildings, um, in housing. And so it's a team of people led by uh, the uh, chief sustainability officer um, Angela Tovar, who are working on a range of different environmental issues from water, uh, from air, um, and from ground fields, um, and, and really with a theme of environmental justice. So we are making progress, um, but in the, in the face of the reality of the budget deficits that we walked into um, office, we're not yet able to stand up a fully separate budget department. What I want to do is make sure that we minimize on any personnel um, reductions uh, for next year. Um, and so in the context of that, uh, we are working hard to make sure that we are responsive and that we've got a robust plan uh, for environmental, taking on environmental challenges, particularly uh, climate change and also reducing our carbon footprint. And I think we're well on our way. Let's bring Alejandra back for a second question. Thank you. Um, and the second question is, um, Southside residents and activists have for years complained about polluting industries like General Iron moving from the wealthy North Side to their neighborhoods, often with the city's financial help in the form of TIFs and other tax incentives. This is a troubling trend and occurring under your watch as mayor and little has, done, has been done to address it. How do you explain your lack of response and what are you doing or planning to do about it? Well, again, I'm gonna have to push back on the premise of your question. If you look at the track record, particularly uh, General Iron on the north side, we've been very aggressive in citing them for a um, range of different environmental um, and uh, code violations. And as you know, uh, when there was a problem on the site uh, earlier this year, we shut them down and would not allow them to restart uh, without making sure that to our um, satisfaction that they've remedied the problem uh, and that they uh, had a plan going forward to make sure that the problem would recur. Now, you talked about General Iron moving uh, to um, the southeast side. General Iron is not moving to the southeast side. There was a company that has been on the southeast side um, for years and years and years. Um, my understanding is without any uh, major environmental challenges that bought the assets of General Iron. So the equipment and some of the other materials will be moving to the southeast side, but it's not accurate to say that General Iron is moving to the southeast side. We take the health and well-being of our residents, regardless of where they live, very, very seriously. 
We put out new um, and tougher environmental standards so that companies can't simply set up overnight, as for example happened in McKinley Park. And so we're gonna hold um, companies, one, to make sure they meet our more rigorous standards, uh, that there's a much more thorough vetting on any proposal to site any new companies uh, anywhere in the city. And we're proud of uh, that record. And we continue to make sure that we hold people accountable um, and do our part uh, to bring environmental justice to areas of the city that really haven't seen it in decades. Can you speak a second about that trend of businesses, um, uh, polluting businesses moving from the wealthy areas of the city to um, the south and southwest sides and address that part of the question? Well, I don't know what you are, what you're referring to there. I think I took it that you were referring to uh, the misnomer that General Iron was moving from Lincoln Park to the southeast side. And as I explained, that's actually not accurate. So I don't know what you're, the, what you're referring to in reference to that question. But that's the only uh, one that I've heard, and it's a misnomer, as I explained. Uh, there are other businesses. Obviously, you mentioned the asphalt plant. Uh, that's not a, a, a translocation, but there are other businesses who are um, locating in the south and southwest side of the city. Um, there was an iron um, manufacturing facility that moved in under Emanuel's administration from the north side to the south side. Um, so, so that trend of uh, businesses, polluting businesses located in the uh, south side and the west side of the city. Yeah, but your premise was that that happened on my watch. Those were businesses that moved uh, before I even ran for mayor. So I'm very familiar with, for example, uh, the mat uh, asphalt that popped up seemingly overnight in McKinley Park. And part of the reason why we changed the rules on planned developments um, is to account for uh, that happening. Uh, because we believe that that was a significant problem. Uh, nobody was happy from the neighborhood perspective as to the way that played out. And what I've heard over and over again from residents in that neighborhood is they had no say. Um, and that was in part because of the old rules on planned development. And we've worked hard to change those and again, hold um, any polluting companies uh, responsible. So those actions happen before I even became mayor. Since I've become mayor, uh, we've um, done our part to make sure that we hold polluters accountable, shut them down uh, where they're not abiding by the rules, and we change the rules of the game so a mat asphalt can't pop up again in McKinley Park. Thank you everyone uh, for your answers and for the questions too. Um, I wanna transition to bring on the Black Club Shies, Mauricio Pena. Uh, to talk about environmental harms. Um, Mauricio has been covering the controversial Hill Code demolition project, which we know sent, dust, sent a dust cloud throughout the Little Village neighborhood in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Mauricio. Hi, Mayor. Um, despite being warned by activists about the potential dangers of exposing Little Village residents to increased pollution amid a respiratory pandemic, your administration granted a permit to demolish uh, an old coal smokestack at the Hoko site in March. Uh, the demolition sent a massive dust cloud across the neighborhood, dropping dirt and particulate matter across homes, cars, and every other inch of this community, you said at the time. Do you regret not stopping the demolition? And do you believe your administration was negligent in its role of vetting the plan? No, I don't believe that we were negligent. Um, this was a, a process that started several years back. Um, and there was an additional step that was taken uh, this spring. Um, but if, if Hilco had done what it promised to do um, in um, getting the permit, then we wouldn't be talking about it right now and you wouldn't know anything about it, neither would I. Um, it was an utter fail on the part of the developer not to live up to uh, the commitments that it had made um, in getting the permit. And we've made sure not only that Hillco was held responsible, but on a going forward basis, we've completely changed uh, the permitting process so that we have real accountability in a way that we didn't have before under the old um, uh, city rules. There hadn't been an implosion um, happening in the city of Chicago, and I believe 10 years prior to uh, what happened on that Hillco site. Um, and we learned a lot from that experience. But really the fault lies, and I think that that's been demonstrated by everybody who's looked at this, the fault lies in the developer for not doing what it committed to do. As you can see from the video 
Um, you can't see any um, water sprayers on site. They committed to us that they would have them there. They committed to us that the implosion would not allow dust to escape the area. Obviously, that didn't happen. So they failed, we held them accountable, and we changed the rules so anything like this can't happen again. Given that th this was happening during the pandemic, do you not regret stopping it, given that, you know, this impacts the respiratory health of a lot of um, people that are uh, that re that get the the virus. Um. So hindsight's always twenty twenty, Mauricio. Um, but what I will say is this: again, if Hillco had done what it said it was going to do, there wouldn't have been any issue. They failed. But in, as a result of that, we work with uh, local residents, stakeholders, the local aldermen to make sure that. Um, the neighborhood was tested for air quality, um, that people were given access to um, health care um, clinics um, and other uh, health professionals in the event that they were facing um, any uh, respiratory issues. Um, and again, it's been a while since I um, uh, have the numbers in front of me, but we work diligently uh, to make sure that any adverse health care uh, consequences were addressed and mitigated. Um, and the videos that you're showing were about 10 minutes um, after that explosion, and then the air quality uh, dissipated substantially. But we worked with the EPA, the IEPA, and CDPH uh, to make sure that we were all over any healthcare consequences uh, that may have happened um, as a result of Hillcall's failure to abide by uh, the permitting uh, process and hold up its end of the bargain. Mauricio, let's, let's go forward to uh, your second question. Okay. A day after the Hillco implosion, you said no work would continue at the site until a full investigation was completed. That's right. Uh, however, a demolition, uh, demolition work and construction has since resumed. What is the status of the full investigation and why hasn't the city provided the complete findings uh, of that investigation to neighbors? I, I, don't, I don't believe that that's correct. Um, we abided by what I said the day after. We had a full investigation. Uh, we disclose that in a series of, of reports to the public over the course of the summer. Um, those, I believe, are still available on the CDPH website. So I don't believe that that actually is correct. Obviously, we did extensive engagement uh, with the community, uh, individual community members, um, uh, elected officials, um, other community-based organizations. We had a series of uh, town halls, both in English and Spanish, and we revealed um, all of the air quality studies uh, that were done and other environmental studies that were done, that was put out um, to the public months ago and it's available um, on the city's websites. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Mauricio, for your uh, question. I wanna move forward to our last topic, which is gonna be policing and the uprisings uh, during the summer. Before becoming mayor of Chicago, organizers, organizers worried about your views on policing, citing your role as the chief administrator at the Office of Professional Standards at the Chicago Police Department and as the police board president um, during the height of the high profile cases of Rakia Boy and Laquan McDonald, who were both killed by police. Um, let's go to the Daily Lines, Alex Nicken, who we'll bring back on to ask uh, his second question, which is about CPAC. Hi. Um, so Back in March, the city council was expected to vote on an ordinance backed by the Grassroots Alliance for Police Accountability, GAPA, that would have created a community commission for public safety and accountability. Um, the ordinance was, was pulled because of some disagreements over details of the plan. And in the meantime, a lot of activists and aldermen have, have rallied behind the alternative CPAC proposal to create an elected civilian police oversight board. So where do these proposals stand right now? What obstacles are still in the way of civilian police oversight in Chicago and why has it taken so long? Well, um, I support civilian oversight of the police. I have uh, since I was the chair of the Police Accountability Task Force where we specifically recommended um, the need for civilian oversight, uh, but, but said that we thought that a more extensive engagement process needed to happen. Um, so we didn't recommend a specific form of civilian oversight. Um, I've spent a lot of time personally uh, with the gap of folks. Um, there were remaining issues that we have been waiting uh, for a long time for them to come to us with a proposal, and they've just never done it. 
So um, we're moving on from GAPA, um, but we I expect to uh, work with um, Alderman to propose an alternative form of uh, civilian oversight that we will introduce um, if either in October or November. We've got to get it done. We've waited too long, um, and we need to move forward. And it's unfortunate uh, that the GAPA folks have not come forward to us uh, with a concrete proposal that that um, identify that solves some of these outstanding issues. But the time is now for us to act. We can't wait any longer. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Alex, again for your question. Um, now I want to jump to the Chicago reporters, Josh McGee, who has a question about, or a couple of questions about police misconduct settlements. Hey, hey, how's it going? As cries grow louder to defund the police, your administration has budgeted $82.5 million to handle police misconduct settlements. That's $60 million more than your prede predecessor. Can you, can, you say the, can you say the number again? $82.5 million to handle police misconduct settlements? Does this I, don't, I don't believe that's correct, but go ahead. Does this discourage or does this discourage police misconduct or encourage it? Well, I, I don't believe that your number is correct. Uh, but let me tell you what we've done uh, to address police misconduct cases. I think you're aware of the fact that I hired and empowered uh, the first ever chief risk officer, uh, Tamika Puckett. Um, and one of the primary things that she's been working on uh, since she's been on board now over a year is working on uh, accountability uh, and risk management for the police department, a lot of which involves uh, police misconduct cases. So I believe that our number um, to date for 2020 and it, we ended 2019 down from historic numbers for police misconduct. But one of the key things that we have to ask, which we were not asking before, but we're asking now is, why are these cases being filed? What's the underlying um, issue? Is the uh, allegations a question of training, supervision, um, or something else? And so we're digging deep and asking what I would call those accountability and risk management questions and I think that that has helped us uh, get better and smarter um, in reducing uh, the amount of money that is actually being paid out. Now, again, we're not going to reverse a trend that has happened um, really unchecked for 10 plus years. But I think we've made incredible progress in making sure that we're raising uh, the question and holding the police department accountable to make sure uh, that it has responsibility and skin in the game about these um, lawsuits. We are an outlier across the country in a number of lawsuits that are filed and pending every year. And we have taken definitive steps to make sure that we reverse that trend. And I think it's showing results. And we will get you specific numbers because I think the number that you cited is not accurate. Okay. According to our analysis, since 2011, the city has settled more than 40 cases for protest related misconduct by officers paying out more than 27 million in protest related misconduct settlements. This year, we've seen videos of cops attacking protesters in Uptown, yelling homophobic slurs, flipping off protesters and kettling protesters, which have arguably been encouraged by your use of raised bridges downtowns. How can communities of color feel safe when protest against police killings and misconduct is met with more abuse that taxpayers will be on the hook to pay for? Josh, I just gotta push back on your, on your question. Um, to say that somebody is encouraging that kind of misconduct is absolutely false and wrong. And as you know, in each of those cases that you cited, those officers were identified, they were stripped of their police powers, and they are in the disciplinary process. So we take misconduct very, very seriously. And when I say we, I mean myself and Superintendent Brown. Um, we have, I think, done a lot to really send a message uh, that uh, we are not going to tolerate officers who step over the line. Look, this has been a very, very challenging environment uh, for the police. And as you've also seen in videos, there are people that have tried to hijack peaceful protests and come armed for a fight with the police. I've spent a lot of time over the course of my almost 60 years um, involved in a lot of marches and protests on a range of different issues, but it never occurred to me to bring a shovel, a bat, um, a tire iron, um, a frozen bottle, a bottle filled with urine, um, or fireworks, and then throw them at the police. And that's some of the things that we have seen 
from vigilantes who have tried to hijack peaceful protests. Um, and really, we've had uh, a number of officers who have been injured as a result of being there to try to help guide and protect peaceful protests. We also are living in an environment where this year alone, we've had over 60 officers shot at by civilians in neighborhoods across the, the, across the city. So we are living in a very challenging time and a very challenging time for policing. I agree with you 100%. We've got to hold officers accountable who cross the line, but we also have to have a serious conversation about what's happening out there. Uh, because what we've seen in some of these protests with people throwing bottles, setting off fireworks, an officer lost his eye. We've had broken arms and other broken limbs. Uh, that is not who we are as a city. We have a long history of peaceful protests and we encourage that and support it. But what we've also seen is a number of instances where the line has been crossed and that I think uh, brings, um, that, that brings dishonor on the peaceful protesters who are out there righteously protesting against a range of issues, not the least of which is violence in our city. Thank so you. I just want to make sure that we have a balanced um, approach and a balanced narrative because there's a lot of challenges that we are all facing. And the only way through is forward by uniting together and not dividing us uh, along different lines. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Josh. Uh, before we wrap up, I just want to get to our final two questions from our own Matt Harvey, who is, the, who is the general assignment reporter for the tribe. He's been covering the uprisings all summer, which were sparked by the police murder of George Floyd in Minnesota back in May. Uh, Matt, you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah. Um, throughout the summer uprisings, the city has cut off CTA access, lifted bridges in more to ensure that looting was kept in check and protests were peaceful. In August, those tactics, in addition to rapid response deployments, robust legal actions, and more, were introduced as a neighborhood protection plan. I've been covering the uprising since George Floyd's murder, and organizers feel that the plan protects property, not people. On a press call in August, you said community stakeholders help form the plan. Who are those community stakeholders? How do you choose who becomes a community stakeholder? And do any of your community stakeholders receive money from the city? We don't choose community stakeholders. I mean, that, that would be antithetical um, to having authentic relationships with people who live in neighborhoods. Uh, they, uh, they range from members of the faith community, uh, people who are uh, active and involved in CAPS, uh, local uh, chambers of commerce, street outreach uh, and intervention folks, um, and obviously business people all over the city. We don't pick them, they are who they are, but we reach out and we certainly engage with them. And I want to address one other aspect of your question uh, regarding um, uh, closing down CTA. We've done that very sparingly. Um, and when we've done it almost every single time, it's at the request um, and really the plea of the unions for the transit workers. For example, in the early days of June, there was such a fear um, on the part of transit workers, bus drivers, um, and um, people who, uh, or ride that the, 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 um, drive the trains, that they were going to be attacked by protesters that they begged us um, to um, shut down the CTA uh, because they didn't feel like their workers were going to be adequately, adequately protected. And we were starting to see a significant amount of call offs. That piece has not been uh, reported by the media, but it's real. If you talk to the ATU uh, members, uh, and to talk to the leadership there, um, I got calls directly from them saying, Mayor, we don't feel safe. We've got to shut down the CTA. Our, our CTA system has been the only public transit system in the country that has run in full operations throughout the pandemic. No other transit system in the country has done that. So we don't take lightly shutting down or doing bypasses. When we've done it, we've done it because of the concern about violence and the safety of those workers. And that has obviously got to be taken into consideration when we think about making sure that everybody in our city um, is protected. We don't want to leave those workers in a vulnerable position. Um, and we're never going to do that. We're going to do what's necessary to make sure that everybody is protected, the employees as well as um, the riders on the CTA. 
Thank you for answering that uh, question. One thing that was left off of that question is, uh, do your stakeholders, do the community stakeholders who you are working with receive money from the city? And then also I'll let Matt ask his second question as I know we're running short on time. Okay. So um, I can't answer that question in, in totality. Um, obviously we engage with a range of different stakeholders. We wanna get honest feedback on what um, they're seeing in their neighborhoods, what their concerns and what residents' needs are. So we engage with a number of different stakeholders. Obviously, in the delivery of services, uh, we have delegate agencies that we also listen to and give us feedback that are um, um, contracted with the city. But by and large, we try to reach out beyond the delegate agencies, as I said, to members of the faith community, uh, to community-based organizations, block clubs, um, Chamber, local chambers of commerce, um, the faith community, a range of different stakeholders who obviously are not um, being paid uh, by the city. And really quickly, Matt, I uh, want to ask your last question. This is the last question for the nightmare. Okay. okay, cool. Among black, brown, indigenous, and queer organizers and activists who I've interviewed over the course of the summer uprising, there's a sentiment that the city goes out of the way to police their demonstrations but not too much to actually listen to and engage with their demands. Have you made any effort to speak to organizers such as Good Kids Mad City, Brave Space Alliance, and Shine Nation's Youth Council about their demands? If so, can you name the ones you've spoken with? And do you see their demands as important enough to include in your policy decisions? Well, we've done a range of engagement across the city, um, and certainly some of the groups that you've named, uh, we have uh, reached out to and there's been dialogue back and forth with members of uh, my team. Um, in some instances, uh, there are, the demands are, are quite clear um, and we're working to try to make sure that we address them. Um, in other instances, we're still continuing um, dialogue to see what the specific solutions are um, that these groups are proposing. I can't say that it's one size fits all because each of them, as you well know, come with different perspectives, different areas of emphasis. But certainly one of the most important things I think that we can and will continue to do during this time is make sure that we're listening, uh, that we come to these discussions with an open mind and an open heart. Um, and we try to build always um, towards solutions. So I'm Thank not you, sure the, answer, the, the questions were completely answered. Um, so do you take into account those demands when it comes to actually creating the policy? That, of course. Uh, we always listen. We always try to take um, into account. And I will tell you, not every group that you've identified has come to us with a list of, as you say, demands. Um, demands is a tough word. Demands um, yeah, said, suggest um, lack, not no interest in collaboration. We want to make sure that we're listening and that we're trying to collaborate and get towards solutions. And I think many of the groups that we've heard from come to these discussions within that spirit. So that was the other thing. You never really said which groups. Uh, that was kind of one of the specifics we were hoping to get. So, well, I, 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 I don't think it's appropriate for me to list off a list of names of groups. We've we've heard from a number of the groups that you've listed and others that you have not. So this is a, a dialogue that's happening really all over the city with individuals, um, also groups and. You talk about, I've talked, you talk to a lot of different activists, but as you know, the city is very, very broad. There's lots of different stakeholders and we're engaging with a lot of people um, in different neighborhoods who may not be in the streets and with a megaphone, but every, but every bit as important for us to make sure that we're listening to and engaging with across a broad cross section of Chicagoans. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Matt, for your questions today. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you, Mayor, again. We really appreciate you participating in Tribe Tuesday. I know that you have to run. Um, but I wanted to ask, you know, hand the mic to you. Is there any closing remarks that you have? Is there anything that you would like to say that no one asked you about today? Well, I think the thing that I'd like to just leave your, uh, you with the journalists and the listeners with is I think that these conversations are really important. Um, I'm guessing that you haven't had these kind of conversations previously with other mayors. Um, and I do think it's important for us to continue uh, to engage with each other, uh, to have uh, open dialogue um, and to ask the hard questions. Um, that's important to me. I learn a lot from 
uh, these uh, conversations, and I hope that we have an opportunity uh, to engage in them again. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks for your thoughtfulness. Uh, thanks for the work that all of you are doing um, every single day uh, to bring to residents across the city um, your perspective and your voice on the issues of the day. Thank you again, Mayor, for participating in Tribe Tuesday. Uh, the mayor is going to exit Tribes Tuesday now, but we're going to open the floor for any questions that people have um, that any of our reporters for the Lands on Lightfoot project can ask or can answer for folks. Um, so we're going to bring everyone back onto the screen. And I guess I want to start with um, Alejandra, because I know that there was a little bit of uh, follow up questions um, to your uh, to your questions about the environment. You know, did you feel that uh, you got the answers that you were looking for today? It's Alejandra back. If not, I can kick it to Maurice, uh, Mauricio. Mauricio, do you feel uh, that you got the answers that you were um, hoping to get today about the Hill Code demolition? Not completely. Um, I think we had, uh, you know, there was a lot. Alejandra's here if, if you want to go with your initial question or you want me to finish. You can finish and I can go yeah. back to Alejandra, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think um, the mayor alluded to some of these meetings um, that happened between the mayor, uh, the mayor's office and uh, some of the residents, uh, community groups. Um, and during those meetings, there was a lot of pushback because there was not there was no transparency um, on a lot of aspects of the project and the, the proposal and and how things were going to move forward. And so um, each meeting that there was, there was a lot of there was contentious conversations um, happening and, you know, to this day, a lot of residents, um, that attended those meetings, um, still don't have the answers that they want from the mayor's office uh, around this project. Um, and I think, you know, there's still protests, there's still people out in the street trying to educate residents about the plan at that, that site. Um, I spoke with a resident the other day that isn't completely aware of what's happening at the site. Um, and, and they live, blocks away. So I don't think the, the city or the developer has done a good enough job to educate, you know, residents near the site as to what's happening um, moving forward. You know, it's wild because I grew up down the street from that uh, smokehouse. I grew up on Pulaski and Lexington. So anytime we were going to, to Midway Airport, we would always pass it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm like, I'm wondering, like, what, what are what are community uh, members saying? Like, what do they want to come out of this situation? So I've been covering this for more than two years now. And since the very, I think a lot of people are upset about the plans that ultimately, you know, were approved. Um, when Mayor Rahm Emanuel uh, closed it down, he said there was gonna be a robust uh, community effort um, to decide what was gonna be on that property. Ultimately that didn't happen. And during the community meetings where Hilco was proposing this development to residents, a lot of residents pushed back on the plan. They asked uh, then Alderman Munoz, um, Ricardo Munoz, to consider an alternate plan, which uh, they laid out during this meeting. Uh, part of it was kind of like a, you know, a commercial kitchen, um, some urban urban growing, uh, urban, uh, growing on that site, um, er, like an urban um, farm. And so it was a pretty comprehensive plan that they've been thinking about for years uh, since that site was closed down in 2012. And so just residents feel like they weren't listened to by the city officials that approved this project and approved it fairly quickly from um, the dates when this, these community meetings happened to, uh, you know, to, to when it was approved by City Hall. And now I want to bring back on Alejandra to talk about, you know, how did you feel um, that the mayor answered your questions, especially around General Iron moving from um, you know, north side to uh, south side neighborhood? I think there was a little bit of pushback from the mayor about um, you know what's really going on there. So how, how did you feel coming out of um, you know the questions that you asked? That's that's a good question. I mean, it's it's a bit of semantics, right? The, the point is that there will still be a company that. Um, that uh, a, a polluting company is still in a neighborhood that is mostly a Hispanic neighborhood, right? Like who owns the company and what the name of the company will be is just semantics. Um, we know that there is a trend. There is a trend that 
and she's right. It didn't start with her. It wasn't, she, um, it started with Mayor Daly and later on with Rahm Emanuel of companies moving from the north side to the south side. I mean, you, you think about, um, uh, the city's history of what they're called plan manufacturing districts, which are this uh, special uh, districts that have the house um, manufacturing companies, and and a lot of those districts, which were created the, during um, Mayor Harold Washington administration, were created to create blue collar jobs, um, and they uh, unfortunately have a lot of companies that also are uh, companies that pollute the air, and and we know that. Um, this was at the end of uh, Emmanuel's administration that the plant manufacturing district in the north side in Lincoln Park was completely done away with, um, and some of those companies have relocated. One of the main companies in that site uh, that with a history of, of uh, polluting the air, Finco, a steel site, moved from the north side to the south side. Now you have another company here, General Air Iron, and you can debate the semantics, but the fact is that there will still be a company in the southwest side that uh, continues to pollute the air. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, I wish she would have answered whether or not she believed that this was a trend. Certainly activists and members of communities and those communities believe it's a troublesome trend. You also have all of these uh, warehouses that are popping out in the southwest side mostly, and those uh, warehouses, uh, themselves may not be pollutants, but they have a lot of traffic and in, in a lot of, um, you know, trucks that also pollute the air. And you can tell, I mean, if you look at the environmental monitors that are in the southwest sides of the city, uh, along corridors like the highway and along uh, the plant manufacturing districts, you can see an elevation of pollution in those areas that are mostly inhabited by Hispanic and Black residents. Um, so, sorry, that was the point. You're, you're good. It makes me think of... Um there's always this conversation about, you know, the next mayor or, or even the next president in this space inheriting, um, you know, the past issues that another may have may have, may have dealt, dealt with. Um, and, you know, talking about Rami Manuel's involvement in this, um, you know, pollution um, problem and then talking about Mayor Daly's involvement in the pollution problem. It just makes me wonder, you know, how, how, how much responsibility does a, a city mayor have in kind of righting the wrongs? that previous mayors have done, you know, is there a responsibility to do that? And um, Alejandro, if you want to talk about that, you can. I mean, you go back to to why people elected the mayor, right? And uh, the promises that were made during the campaign, um, and there there were definitely environmental justice promises made in the, during the campaign. Um, one of those promises was to create a Department of Environment. I mean, we know based on the BGA investigation that um, the number of inspections during Emmanuel's administration, when he got rid of the Department of Environment, completely. Um, fail. And that is a problem because if the city is not enforcing the law, if the city is not inspecting businesses that are polluting, then there we know from an inspector general's investigation that those companies are polluting the air. Um, so to your question of whether uh, they are responsible for the decisions of previous administrations. Of course, they're not responsible entirely for those decisions, but they inherited the problems and they're responsible for the decisions that they're currently making in not in not addressing the issue uh, or addressing it um, in a way that is not, uh, that the residents feel that is not taking them into account. Thank you so much. And I kind of want to jump to uh, Josh McGee because there was some pushback with Josh's questions as well, especially surrounding uh, the numbers of, 82.5 million um, budgeted for police misconduct settlements and that being 60 million more than uh, Mayor Lightfoot's predecessor. And I saw people in the comments saying that, you know, the numbers may even be higher, you know. So, Josh, can you talk about um, the response you got to your question? Yeah, I think it was uh, a little bit shifty. Um, but, yes, we know that Ram had budgeted around 27 million for it. And, you know, in 2018, it was a record breaking year for police misconduct and settlements. So we know that number is going up each year or has gone up in each year, not necessarily from 2018, but we're seeing um, just a lot of, a lot of money uh, being thrown at police misconduct and settlements and lawsuits. And um, I think when people are talking about defunding the police, that you need to look at every part of the budget and, and take a, a, a deep look at what our taxpayer money is being spent towards. How does this impact the budget season we're getting ready to go into? Because those talks are about to ramp up. Um, 
next month. I mean, I think that every single person should be looking at that budget and seeing where the money is going to. And these are the ways to, to cut down the police budget. And one last question I have for you, Josh, is, uh, you know, a lot of people don't know the, pro the journalism process, the journalistic process of reporting um, on an investigative subject like this. Can you talk a little bit about like what goes into um, reporting on police misconduct settlements? You know, how did you all do this reporting? How did you get the numbers? You know, what, um, months and months of foying. Um, we've looked at tons of lawsuits, like hundreds with researchers. Um, a lot of help from Northwestern's um, students, um, but hundreds of FOIAs. And um, you just really have to take a long look at some of the problems that we see. And I think this is one of the best ways to do it. Thank you, Josh. And I uh, wanna stay on police and, and go to Matt who um, asked questions about the um, the uprisings this summer and got a little bit of pushback too, in terms of you know whether community stakeholders receive money from the city or not. And, who's considered a stakeholder and how do they choose a stakeholder? Um, Matt, how did you feel about the response that you received? Um, I think that definitely with the first question, uh, there was a bit of like dodging a little bit because um, my question was kind of like, who? how did you decide who, what stakeholders you're speaking with? Um, but really what was answered is that like pretty much anybody can be a stakeholder um, and that's something that I would, I mean, I'm not sure anyone would necessarily disagree with that idea that anybody could be a, a community stakeholder. All you have to do is live in the community. Um, but yeah, so I think that a lot of time, a lot of it was kind of leaning back on a part of the question that could be, you know, answered easily. But uh, yeah, the, the answers weren't necessarily satisfactory. Like I, I, I didn't necessarily understand why it would have been inappropriate to name uh, an organization that that she had uh, spoken to and whose demands that she were was considering within her uh, own policy proposals. Uh, I'm not sure if there's like a PR thing or like a legal reason or whatever, but that it just didn't necessarily make sense to me that that answer. But um, I think uh, she did her best at, at uh, answering the questions the way she saw fit. Uh, folks who are watching, if you have questions, drop them in the live chat. We're going to start bringing in questions from the audience soon that uh, any other reporters can answer, and it could be about anything. Um, but Matt, I also want to ask you too, since you've been out covering the protests um, and the uprising since May, what are the organizers saying? Like, what's going on on the ground? What do they want? What are the, the demands? Because they know there was there was this question of like, are the demands being considered? Um, yeah. The policies are coming up. Yeah. So. Pretty much that they they're being ignored for the most part. It's like uh, you know the we were supposed to be getting a, a progressive mayor uh, uh, who would be on the you know right side of the issue, but it seems that at organizers who are you know maybe not even just the ones that are outside protesting, but also ones that are just you know ha trying to push forward uh, legislation, trying to write uh, you know or city ordinances to to put in the city council, like they, I feel like they just kind of feel like they're being ignored. That like the things that they care about aren't necessarily things that this quote unquote progressive uh, mayor cares about, um, at least not to a degree that she's willing to make any like uh, real significant radical change. It seems like a, a lot of uh, just having conversations with people and, and uh, you know, things that we're thinking about, but not necessarily things that we're uh, trying to put into real, uh, put any real writing behind. You know? Understandable. And let's bring some questions into the chat so we can get some questions answered. And uh, hey, Bruce, Yana, and Alex, I'm gonna you know, ask y'all about the responses to your questions too. Um, the first question that, that we have up is for Jesus. Did you agree with the mayor's assessment that our census collection numbers here in Chicago were amongst the highest in the country for big cities. I could not find any such data. And that's from Jose Maldonado. Yeah, thank you. Well, not in fact, for example, uh, several cities in California have higher rates of response. Uh, possibly uh, in the area, the historical data 
kind of be uh, compatible with what we are seeing today. But in any case, the thing is that our rates of response are very low. And with that uh, level, we are going to have trouble, as mentioned in terms of federal funds, in terms of, of representation, because if we suddenly see uh, some district being removed or, or you know, redraw in a way that reverse the, uh, you know, decades of fighting for political That's empowerment actually. from for African American communities, from Hispanic communities, that is going to be really bad. Then uh, I, I don't think that we have very good rates, and there are other cities in the country that have a lot better responses. Thank you, Jesus. Let's bring up another question. That was a good one, Jose. Any more questions here? I'm seeing a lot in the chat. Our team is working on bringing up a question. Give us one second. In the meantime, while we're finding a question to pull up, please fill out um, a survey that we have in the chat right now. Um, the survey helps us stay engaged with our audience and uh, learn more about the type of Tribe Tuesday events you want to see, the type of discussions you want to have, and we try to find experts to bring them on and have those discussions with us. Um, and also subscribe to our YouTube channel while you're here, too. Um, we appreciate all the support that people have been giving us since we started. Um, so thank you again. Uh, we have a question ready, y'all. Looks like we don't have a question ready to go. I'm going to go back to Yana um, about schools. You know, there's a lot of conversation and worry about um, the, the possibility of schools opening up in November. Uh, can you talk to me about the response you got from the mayor today and, and what's kind of going on um, with parents, with teachers, with anybody who's working in the school system? You know, what are their thoughts and feelings? Yeah, I think... Um... It feels like it's uh, sort of happening under the radar, but I think there's really a crisis going on with families in Chicago right now. Um, I think remote learning is incredibly hard to do. Um, there's a lot of concern about the trying to, um, the district's effort to have like a sort of a full school day that happens online. So especially for parents of special education students um, or like really young learners, that's really a challenge and it asks a lot of parents kind of do that work. Um, at the same time, any question about opening schools uh, raises really big questions about safety. And um, the Chicago Teachers Union has been doing sort of a lot of organizing and pushback around particularly workers that are called into schools right now and how to keep them safe. Um, so I think what I wanted to hear that I didn't from Mayor Lightfoot's response was that um, most epidemiologists that have been following school reopenings across the country have said that in a lot of ways that it really is a trade-off between opening schools and opening um, businesses, restaurants, bars. So some of the commercial establishments, there's, you know, there's the economic push there, there's a big lobby there. Um, but the reality is that bars and restaurants, that means more community spread. And the more community spread, the more dangerous it is to open to open schools. Um, but I think at the same time, there's a real question about what this will mean for kind of like a whole generation of students who are struggling through the first ever online school year. Yeah, I was gonna ask, cause my mom is a school nurse and uh, for CPS and I mean, just the idea of her having to go back to school is terrifying, you know? And and I think Adam Corson here asked that same question. Like, do you agree with the mayor's thinking that bars and restaurants have no impact on going back to school. I mean, if if uh, dozens of people are going to the bars and to the clubs and to the restaurants or wherever, um, and then they got to turn around and go to work, you know, that's just it just seems like more exposure. But you tell us your thoughts on it. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that um, asking people that are working, um, any jobs that anyone is doing outside the house right now, are there's like a risk to catching um, COVID-19. That is just a reality. Um, there have been about 250 cases since March um, of employees that have been going into Chicago, employees or contractors that have been going into Chicago schools. So, um, you know, it's not totally clear where those cases originated, but we know that that happens and that's a risk. Um, and the 
my, my sense of the broad agreement is that the less community spread there is, the more that work like going into schools is safer. So I think um, the question that I'm hearing from a lot of families and a lot of teachers is what what is the priority? Um, like what is the city's priority for what is going to open? And I think on schools, um, even though the actual projected next date for schools to possibly reopen is November 9th. That's in less than six weeks. We haven't really heard anything about what are the metrics that we're going to use to decide if that is safe. Um, what investments are there to make sure if people do go in, that will be safe. So I think that there's a big question of like, what is the um, kind of investment or thought process around considering school reopening? And then I think if it doesn't happen, how will my question is how will the district address ways to make remote learning better and meet kind of like a really broad group of diverse needs of students? Yeah, because I'm seeing people ask about remote learning in, in the chat now too. Like, has anyone put? And this is from Miriam. Has anyone pushed CPS to have a better remote model? Every day I get on social media and I'm seeing parents and teachers complaining about um, uh, complaining about remote learning. I'm seeing parents take screenshots of kids and like putting it places and you know it's just so many different things that's going on when it comes to remote learning um you know what's happening with that and is that is that running well right now yeah um hi miriam um yeah i think that that is a real uh question and i think there's sort of a sense of being between a rock and a hard place of um the risk if students return to school versus like how do you make a remote learning model and make sure the students are learning or getting their needs met um so i think a lot of the conversation about a better remote learning model um I think is happening like within classrooms. I'm hearing about some teachers that are really adamant about having students avail like on a screen for a certain amount of time. And then other educators who are saying, okay, I have learners that can't do this. What is a way that I can um, have modifications for that? Uh, the Chicago Teachers Union has also been pushing for a shift in how remote learning works, which will be would be less screen time and kind of an other broader ways of assessment. But um, it's the first few weeks and we're really still trying to understand um, sort of what are the main mandates from the district and then how much that's actually happening in, in schools. And part of what remote learning has done is really isolated everyone. It's isolated families, it's isolated students. So folks should reach out to us and let us know how that's going so we can um, kind of help to get your voices out there. And that's Chalk Beach, Chicago, y'all. They do amazing coverage um, of the school system in Chicago. So if you're a parent, teacher, anyone in the school system, reach out to them and let them know what your experience is like. I um, want to last go to Alex Nitkin, who asked about affordable housing, during, especially during COVID-19, but also asked about CPAC. When you asked the CPAC question, a lot of people came in the chat and had things to say. Um, how did you feel about your response? The response? Yeah, it was really interesting. I mean, unfortunately, for the folks who were really interested in, in the CPAC proposal, it seems like that is not does not have as much support within the city council as the alternatives is first of all of, of what uh, the original GAPA proposal. Um, but CPAC does have a lot of supporters in the council, most notably, I think, um, Andre Vasquez from the 40th Ward has just um, sent a letter to Chris Taliaferro, the chair of the Public Safety Committee in the city council, asking for a hearing to talk about police accountability. I think he and Talaferi himself, and clearly even the mayor, are really frustrated that nothing has really come about in terms of legislation. Um, like I mentioned in my question, there was a proposal that seemed like it made it all its to the finish line in March to um, have a sort of police accountability board that was proposed by GAPA. Um, that ended up hitting a snag because of a dispute over as I understand it, who would have the final say in disputes between the accountability board and the um, uh, and the police? Gappa wanted it to be the citizens board would have the final dispute. The mayor said, no, I want the mayor to have the final say. Um, and so uh, Lightfoot is now saying, we're just moving forward and doing it a different way. way. And so I guess we'll be watching in October to see Thank if you, that Yeah, we're going to wrap up because, I mean, we've been on here for a while and we don't want to take up too much of your time. There is a presidential debate happening tonight that we all need to be watching and listening to as well. Um, but I just want to thank all the Lands on Lightfoot partners for participating. Definitely want to thank um, 
the Institute for Nonprofit News, Robert R. McCormick Foundation, and the Joyce Foundation for their involvement in the Lens on Life Foot Project and for helping us bring this uh, to fruition. We also want to thank the Field Foundation of Illinois, who uh, sponsored Tribe Tuesday. Uh, Tribe Tuesday would not be possible uh, without the Field Foundation of Illinois. And um, just want to, I mean, should we let everyone say one final word before we bounce out? Um, is there anything people need to know about what you're working on, any stories in the pipeline, or um, just anything that we didn't really talk about here that you might want to say uh, really quickly? We can start. In the order that we uh, ask the questions, let's start with uh, La Raza, Jesus. Thank you. Well, we here in La Raza, we are celebrating this year our 50th anniversary, and it's a great achievement, but it's a, a struggle too in these conditions. But we are keeping our coverage about many things, but especially COVID-19 right now, which is affecting the Latinx community very hard, and we want to keep informing about that as much as possible. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go to Yana. What's going on at Chalkbeat? Yeah, thanks, Averin. Um, So I would just want to say that we are in the middle of basically, at least in my lifetime, the biggest change in public education and education writ large. I think I can't understate how much of a shock and transition it is all over the country to be figuring out remote learning and safety around COVID-19. So we really want to hear from families. Um, we really want to hear from students. We want to hear from teachers. Folks should reach out to us because I think your voices are so important. Um, in the work that we do. Thank and you, thank Yana. you, everyone. Yeah. And uh, let's go to the Daily Line. Alex, any last words? Um, I don't think so. I mean, we are working every day to demystify what is happening behind the scenes or in the legislative process in city council. We're going to be working really hard uh, through the budget season and pick through whatever is proposed, not only by Mayor Lightfoot, but by Tony Preckwinkle on the county side. So hope um, folks follow us for that. And yeah, thank you so much, Tiffany and the whole tribe right, team for putting you. this together. This and really uh, BGA, Alejandra. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you everyone who's tuned in um, to hear our questions today. The BGA, the Better Government Association, is also a nonprofit news organization. We do long-term, long-form investigative reporting. Um, and yeah, we, we want to hear from you, what, what you thought about tonight. Uh, awesome. Send us a note. Lock up Chicago, Mauricio, any last thoughts? Yeah, thank you, uh, Tiffany. Thank you to the tribe. Thank you, everyone that participated and everyone that watched. Um, yeah, just Block Club Chicago, we bring you hyper-local news of the different neighborhoods. Um, so we'll, we'll keep on doing that. We're continuing to look into Hilco, uh, looking to some FOIAs that we received. Um, so uh, yeah, blockclubchicago.org. Um, and hit us up if you guys have any tips on neighborhood stories. Um, and Josh, what's going on with you? Tell us what's going on at uh, Chicago Reporter and what you look for. Yeah, I'd just say look forward for our reporting on Chicago police misconduct um, and settlements um, coming from the Chicago Reporter sometime soon. And then we got to wrap it up with Matt, our own Matt Harvey. What you got? Yeah, just look forward to a recap of uh, tonight's Lens on Lightfoot event. Uh, tune in, you know, the tribe.com uh, and just see what we've got cooking. Julio. Julio. So, well, thanks again, everybody. Sure. Follow us at the tribe um, on Twitter, on Facebook, it's at the tribe, and on Instagram, it's at the tribe Chicago. Also, fill out the survey in the chat if you can. Um, that helps us figure out what the next Tribe Tuesday is going to be about. And also, always go to the tribe.com to check out our stories. We're dropping stories more often now. So, you know, go in there and see what we got going on. Again, thank you. I'm Tiffany Walden, editor-in-chief of The Tribe, co-founder of The Tribe, and most importantly, a Westsider. So talk to y'all later. Thanks.